Okay, welcome to the Lighthouse. We're back again. God willing, uh, Sunday night, we're going to have an event in New York at, in Five Towns. Uh, and then we'll be back again here again Tuesday nights. Okay, we have a very, very exciting class. Today's class is in, obviously, the Rufur Shalem of Yerachmil, the end of Tova Basha, and the succession of Elisheva Banavah, Gadiel Ben Elisheva, Shef Ben Elisheva, Emma Ben Elisheva, and Reina Makav Tova Basha. Okay, we have a very, very exciting class today. Um, the books that I'm going to take today are... One is Rav Nachman's Wisdom. This is a phenomenal book for everybody to buy, Rav Nachman's Wisdom. It's a great book, short, very short, but very practical teachings. And obviously one of my favorite books, Let It Go. And we're going to really, really find a way how to let it go and be happier and have better relationships and better life. The chart that we're going to be using for the Facebook world is the map of consciousness. This is the map of consciousness. This is exactly... Basically, this map tells us exactly where we're at, how we view the world, etc. So the purpose of, of, of this class is really the, the advantages of letting it go is you're going to have better relationships, you're going to have a better, much greater mood, more success, be more willing to be more open to things, be more willing to not hold on to things so much, your health improves. I mean, there's so much that could be achieved in this class. Um, and it's one, probably one of the biggest tools in my life that I've used and I've found ways to just let things go. Instead of holding on to things and, hold, and, 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 and just basically taking my energy and displaying on other people. We need to recognize that the way we live and the way we think, and I'm going to explain to you exactly how to cope with it. The majority of the world is focusing too much on thoughts and they're not focusing on the feeling. They're focusing on getting rid of their thoughts or clearing their thoughts, and they're overwhelmed by their thoughts instead of focusing on, on the feeling that's causing the thoughts. So Rabbi Nachman says this exactly 100%. He says, the thoughts in one's mind are truly among God's wonders. Thoughts exist in a mind in groupings, like bundles stacked on top of each other. When a person needs a fact, he remembers it by drawing it from one place in his mind. Then it's a great wonder, where did it come from? All of a sudden he associates this, and he associates that. All of a sudden, how does your mind able to associate? You know, you watch a heat game, and next thing you know, you associate the time that you were at a date with some girl on a heat game, and how the date went well or not. It's just amazing how your mind associates things. And he's saying many associations and symbols are located in these bundles in the mind. One remembers a fact because he encounters an idea, and he associates some kind of association with it. This idea is brought forth as bundles. We know this is very true in trauma. You know, a person can all of a sudden, you know, smell perfume that they were, somebody, God forbid, um, did something to them, and that perfume can all of a sudden trigger an anxiety attack, a panic attack, a complete shutdown. So we know our mind works on associations. This is how we associate things, is exactly how our mind works. When a particular thought emerges, all of the thoughts of the mind are turned over to be rearranged in a different pattern. It is just like anything else, like you pick up something, something else falls, and it gathers there. Basically, what Nachman is telling us, wherever you focus, that's where your mind is going to go. Wherever your focus goes, that's exactly where your mind is going to go. And what really determines our focus? Our consciousness. Our consciousness. How we view the world, what we're holding, that determines your focus. So like Rab Nachman is saying here, our, th our thoughts are really triggered. When you get a thought, instead of focusing, imagine today if I told you, and I work in recovery, and I have rehab centers, and I, and I co constantly tell people, imagine all of a sudden if I took nine rabbits right now, and I threw them, and I put them all over the place. Now you go, go try catching nine rabbits at one time. You're going to be like, I can't do this. You get overwhelmed, and you shut down. Imagine all of a sudden you're, you live with fear, and all of a sudden you get, um, the boss tells you take the day off. It's the end of the world for you. You're going to go into a panic attack. Oh my God, I'm getting fired. He doesn't like me anymore. What is, what is he checking? You're going to become, become paranoid. All of a sudden, 10, 15 things are going to come. What am I going to do with my house? What am I going to do with my relationship? What is my wife going to think of me? What is my husband going to think of me? You're just going to be overwhelmed with, a, with, a, with a abundant thoughts. Now go try to catch every single one of those thoughts and try to be physically sane. It's not going to happen. Or walk into a relationship where 
all of a sudden you're in a relationship and you think your partner's cheating on you. All of a sudden, all you need is the phone, is the phone to ring. All you need is the phone to ring at 9.30 at night. It's over. Nothing else. Over. Who's that? Who's that? Who's calling you at 9.30 at night? Who did you speak to? Are you cheating on me? Blah, blah, blah. End of the world. End of the world. Nothing happened but the phone call. Because the underlying emotion is fear. Fear will trigger the 9,000 thoughts. And then you shut down. You go into panic because you don't know how to deal with them. The same thing, if you have trust in the relationship, you're married for a long time, the phone rings, you're not going to even think about more than one thing. Okay, somebody's calling, probably something at work, probably there's an emergency, something. So all of a sudden, the phone rings, takes on completely different meaning for different people. Because of what the consciousness you're holding at that, at that time. Very important to understand that. So always trying to fix a thought without focusing on the underlying feeling behind it, it's never going to work. Not only is it never going to work, but you're going to constantly, constantly be more frustrated and become more overwhelmed because these triggers just trigger exactly how you feel about yourself. And this is why this, this consciousness chart of consciousness is basically telling us pretty much what we're holding on to, where we're at, what our energy level is, how we view the world. Clearly, an angry person will get into an accident. First thing he's saying, I'm going to sue this guy. A person who lives in a higher consciousness, he gets into an accident, he's going to say, thank you, Hashem, Kapara, at least nothing happened. You have insurance, I have insurance, and they'll walk away from the accident. But the same accident happened. Two people can react completely different based on what that person is holding. How we, how we get to this place in the first place, we get to this place by accumulating a lot of events in our lives, never, never giving meaning, and never letting it go. So really the three steps that you're going to have, three forms of letting go today, are forgiveness is one, acceptance is another one, and surrendering. These are, these are forms of letting it go. When you, when you accept and you're happy with the situation, you, you let it go. The energy no longer can, it holds you. You're able to now elevate that, that emotion. But emotions, are, again, are like energy to just pass through you. And the worst thing we could do, and, and again, I'm, I'm sitting here, I was trying to help a couple the other day in my office, which literally turned into a disaster because they're both angry at each other. So what do you, what, blaming, blaming the whole time, playing ping pong, playing tennis, playing this, this one did it. You did that, you did that, you did that. All anger. So I said, listen, unless, if you're, you guys are here, you guys are at 150, a very, very low, I'm sorry, anger's at... Um, Anger's at 150. Until you get to a place where you can start forgiving, which is 350, forgiveness, mercy, acceptance, well, what can I help you? What can I possibly help you? It's just another event that's going to happen. It could be the, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the neighbor said hi to you, and, and you're saying the, the most craziest things. Because we remember, the way energy works is we hold energy in. It's internal. And people just set us off. We are holding the energy, but people set us off. That's why many people will be pissed off by different things. And some people won't be upset by different things. It really depends on the energy that you're holding at that time. Energy needs an outlet to escape, and that's usually people, friends, families, etc., or people that you're dealing with. So the way we can... The way we can know how we elevated that, is when you have a positive attachment. Remember, we, re we always remember insults, but we never remember compliments for some reason, right? Because it's the resistance that keeps the energy alive. Remember, resistance is what keeps the energy alive. So I'm going I'm to talk about little by little the mechanism of letting go. But you have to understand, by not letting go, what it's costing you. It's costing you exhaustion. It's costing you your mood. It's costing you your relationships. It's costing you pretty much everything. It's, it's a across-the-board problem. And ultimately, our Creator, the vehicle to get closer to our Creator is one thing. Joy and love. That is the highest form of prophecy. You want to get, you want to get closer, you want to have prophecy, it's joy and love is the highest form. Our Creator wants to come to a person when he's in a state of joy. 
and he's not with a person if the person has no control over his mind. So there's an advantage because my prayers could be different. So I'm not letting go for that because I need to prove I'm right or wrong. I'm letting go because I need my energy when I pray. I'm letting go because I need my energy when I work. I'm letting go because I want to be happy. Letting go will lead you to happiness. There's a great line that when you go, when you look, there's a great line by, um, her name is Jen Chan. She says, if you let go a little, you will have a little peace. If you let go a lot, you will have a lot of peace. And letting go, like I said, forms, we're going to talk about the technique itself, but just understand, my thoughts and my being overwhelmed and my associations, it's really rooted in the feeling is causing that. A person with low self-esteem, a person that's feeling guilt, it doesn't take much to trigger him there. And the energy level, if you see, of guilt is, is, is 30, negative 30. A negative of grief, when we have grief, for example, we go through things in life, we regret, or we, we, we have grief, we have a form of, you know, we don't, we don't accept what happened to us. What, do you think is gonna, what, what emotion do you think is going to pop up? Grief. And then what happens when you're walking around with grief? All you're saying is, I should have bought that building. I should have bought that relationship. I should have been. You become the blockbuster movie of the year. I should have done that. Too much accumulation of the past and not enough accumul and too much accumulation of the future is what causes stress. I should have done this. I should have been better. And what, what are you going to do when you keep on? You're just reinforcing that. And then we just look, we walk around like a, like a lost puppy with missed opportunities. And then when real opportunities come to us, what's going to happen? You're not going to take it because you're going to say, it didn't work back then, why will it work now? So this is a, you know, it's, yes, you can go to therapy, but therapy will identify where you're at. But you have to do work, such as the letting go, and we can use many mechanisms, such as faith, surrender. We have books, we have knowledge today. We don't have to hold on to this. Um, when Rav Nachman clearly had problems when he was in, going through many, many saras, he told, Rav Nachman told himself, very simple, what is your problem? Just make yourself into nothing like you don't exist. So what happens? You can't resist. <laughs> you can't, there's no resistance. That energy can't live anymore. It's the resistance. Another key component to this situation. Any time that we're working on a feeling, let's say I was insulted by somebody. So what is the feeling going to be? Anger. Okay? I have to, if I want to get rid of that feeling of anger, I have to notice the, the feeling. I have to let the feeling pass through me. Not judge it. Observe the feeling, and most important, I have to forget about who made me angry and what made me angry. Because what and who, I'm not going to be able to do that, because that is the resistance. Do you understand? Basically, resistance in life is telling us exactly what we need to do. Resistance is a sign that this is exactly what you need to do. That is the purpose of resistance. If I have a, if I have a resistance for giving somebody, it's exactly what I need to do. And ultimately, what God wants us to do is to become, like the Arizal says, is to become a co-creator. Imagine you showing up on a date, with, not with anger. Imagine you showing up on a date with mercy and, 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 and love. What do you think is going to happen? You're not going to be judgmental. If a person's not physically well and he's not mentally well, you're not going to judge him. You're going to say, Shema, you're going to pray for the person after the date. You're not going to go in and hate the person. Because you're, in, you're at such a higher consciousness. When you're at a higher consciousness, people hurt you, you know what you do? You pray for them. And you say, that person hurt me because he's not in a mental, he's, not, he's limited in his capacity of thinking. You would never even have a grudge towards your parents. You would say, my, my parents, the way they treated me is based on their limitations. It has really nothing to do with me. So your whole life is not about holding things in, making become self-absorbed. Your whole life is really about how do I find a good point in this? Where another person's blaming the parents their whole life for where they're at. And then because they're reinforcing that, that negative energy. And of course, again, thinking about something is not enough. You have to come to a level of acceptance, surrender, or a form of forgiveness. 
This is the best way. When I accept something, that when I say I accept it, the simcha. Toda Hashem, I accept it. Thank you, Hashem, I accept it. I no longer resist that situation. That door is closed in my life. That's why our sages say a person who rejoices in his suffering, it's like he brought a sacrifice. It's like he, he brought a sacrifice. It's the highest form. Because for you to rejoice in your suffering, for you to rejoice in a situation, even say thank you in advance, it's because you, you worked on getting such a higher consciousness. You worked on yourself so much that you're able to see that situation completely different. You're able to see that as a creator, not as a victim. So we have to basically, little by little, if you see how we created our... our a lot of it happened when we were children... But how we created our, basically what happens in our life. You can see most people in recovery that are using drugs, they're always, they're, they're, they're definitely, they're in shame. So you could see the clients that walk into our, our facility, right away they feel a tremendous amount of shame. Because they, obviously they got something that they didn't deserve. They, work, they got high in five minutes instead of working on them. And what happens? They end up going back to shame. They wanted a higher consciousness, but didn't work for it. So right away, they go back to shame. And this is exactly, like I said many times, this is exactly why people use substances. The reason why is because they could be in a very low, in a very, very low consciousness level, and then about, all of a sudden, you take two, you take two martinis, all of a sudden, you go from 100, fear or grief, to 100, to all of a sudden, to, to love, which is 350, 450. Who wouldn't want to do that? Who wouldn't want to move consciousness in about five minutes where you can all of a sudden become a different person? It's a great... Who, who, why do you think they keep on becoming addicted? They're addicted to that higher level of consciousness. But the problem is now they have to earn it. By little by little, letting go. So of course addicts, can you blame them for wanting to be happy and wanting to feel love? So what, what an addiction does is it takes these lower levels of consciousness and it just blocks it out. It just numbs it out. doesn't mean they get there. That's the true self. That's how they're really supposed to be. The real self is to, at that high level. But because they want it so quickly, without earning it, it leads them back to shame. So what happens? They keep on go back and forth. They go back to that light. That's what they're doing. That's, the, that's the, any idea of an addiction. It's jumping consciousness really quick without earning it. Easy come, easy go. How would they be able to do it? by little by little working on surrendering each of these emotions. For example, if they have guilt, if they have shame, let it go. Are you here to repair or are you here to despair? Let it go. Little by little, as they work through the consciousness chart, then they no longer need the quick boost because they're already little by little feeling better. A sign that you've let go of something is you feel lighter. Because like we said, this energy is holding on to you. Not only is it holding on to you, worse, it's forming your personality. And your personality becomes, it's dictating the way the world looks for you. And when you get to this level, you'll see it's so obvious that you will never, ang you will never argue with an angry person. You won't even argue with them. You will never even entertain it. Because there'd be no point. There'd be no point. No matter what you do, you can't help them. So tomorrow he's upset about the venti cappuccino. The next day he'll be upset that the, the Krispy Kreme, you know, didn't fill the donut with enough sprinklers. You understand? It doesn't take much. It doesn't take much to get an angry person angry. It doesn't take much. It's not a, you don't need a Yeshua. It just needs any little thing. Because remember, he's already a complete boiling inside already. He needs an outlet. So whoever the outlet could be, just pick the, pick the person who's going to set him off. And we see that when we're upset and we're angry and we're holding things in. It doesn't take much. The dog barking the wrong time. It's over. The day's over. It's because we are holding in these things. And this is the number one thing for the, the importance. When we get into a marriage and you have, you're holding in both of holding and resentment. You could be in a beautiful, gorgeous house. But if you don't pick up the kids on time, it'll be the end of the world. Kaddish for the guy. It'll be, if she doesn't do this, forget it. Disaster. Every little thing in that house will be a disaster because they, they, instead of dealing with these things, they've hold, held on to it. So it doesn't take much for you to get screamed at. And this is what happens in life when we don't have a meditation. This is what happens in life when we don't have a, a, a daily ritual of letting go. 
This is, a, uh, this is what happens to life. This eventually it forms, becomes who you are. And it becomes who you are. It's, and unfortunately, with not only that, but if you see the God view, believe it or not, Rav Nachman says clearly that our Creator is known to us based on our estimate of Him, our perception. Everybody has a different perception of God. But the way we see Him, Rav Nachman says, is based on our perception of Him, based on the gates. He uses the word gates, sharim. That means your perspective, your view of life is how you see. So a person that obviously, you know, he lives grief, he lives in grief, he hasn't let it go. He's going to think that life is tragic. There's no simcha in life. What's the point? And what's the emotion of grief? The lungs. It's all connected, by the way. Lungs, grief, same thing with, with anger. What's the emotion of anger? The liver. So obviously, usually people that get angry, they end up becoming alcoholics, a lot of them, to deal with it. Alcohol, liver, anger, goes together. That's the organ. It's all connected. Your body, the emotion, the, the drug of choice, exactly connected to how, what the person wants in his life. I, I don't have to be a genius to say Oh, you have resent something happened to you, you didn't let it go? How'd you know? I don't have to tell Because anger, anger is alcohol. Anger is alcohol. Heroin is love. Heroin is love. Everybody has a specific drug, unfortunately, that, that, that suits, that, that gets them a certain thing. The, the heroin is a form of feeling whole, feeling oneness, feeling like I, I was in my mother's stomach, something that they never had. So why wouldn't they run to that? So you could see the patterns, but what we try to do with anybody is first you have to let go. Because if we don't let go and accept these things, these unresolved issues, then we really can't, you know, you're only limited when you have a person holding so much anger. Yes, he can have a good day. He'll have a good day, maybe his, uh, the heat won for him and he's in a good mood or he got a raise. But that's only going to last a couple of days. It's just a matter of he pops again. But when you start letting go, letting go, letting go, you go from, you all of a sudden you change, your, you change your consciousness, you change your level, and you change your energy level ar- around you. So this is, the, this is the, the, the important thing is your relationship, your consciousness, and your relationship with your creator go hand in hand. A person who, who, who lives on a very trusting, merciful mindset, he'll believe, he believes that whatever comes from his creator is love. Maybe I don't understand it. Maybe I'm confused. Like we always say, God, I love you, but I don't understand you. But he'll, he'll, he'll be able to accept and go into bittal. But a person who, who, who doesn't, who, who views as his anger, he's going to view his creator as vengeful, as a, as a person on a stick, uh, old guy on a stick with a ready to strike you. Because that's the way you view the world. That is the perception of the world, and that is your dot, that is your capacity. And you need to understand the way our emotions work in the first place. The way our emotions work, and you're going to tell me, you're right, he's right, yes, he's right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Nobody's saying he's a per- you're right to be upset. You're right to do this, but what is that person doing for you? So already he already did the damage. Already you want, to control, you want him to control tomorrow for you too? That is the problem. Already you have the damage already. So how much more damage is that person going to create? When, is it, when are you going to be free? When are you going to be free eventually? That's the key. Freedom is really, when we let go, all of a sudden the resistance is gone. Because we said before, resistance is what keeps something alive. Resistance is what keeps something alive. And the mechanism of the ego is resistance, which leads us to suffering. Many times we've gave you guys the example that pain is non-negotiable. But if pain is accepted, it becomes growth. But if pain is resisted, it becomes suffering. Do you understand? The resistance of pain becomes suffering. And that suffering becomes despair if it doesn't have any meaning to it. So that formula keeps on coming back to us. But if we're able to now see that situation completely different, so he's saying here that the mind is therefore a survival mechanism. It's a method of survival and its primary use of emotions. Thoughts and emotions, and eventually emotions, become shorthand for thoughts. Thousands of millions of thoughts can be replaced by one single emotion. 
all of a sudden, let's say you start having trust in your creator, you're going to walk, you're going you're gonna to view this, this Dr. Fauci on TV, you're going to laugh. Oh, who is this clown, Dr. Fauci, all the telling me what to do? You're not going to, if you're living in fear, oh my God, he said to put this, he said to do tomorrow, we can't, we have to do this, we have to do <gasps> Over. You see the truth, you see behind the BS in life. When you're living in trust, God shows you. He gives you vision. But if not, we walk, we walk around with these fallen fears. So either we have trust in our Creator, trust gives you vision. What, what do you mean vision? It means He opens up your eyes. When you trust in Him, God gives you mercy and He opens up your eyes. But when we don't trust in Him, we fall into fallen fears. And these fallen fears, like we said the other day, these fallen fears have the ability to attract exactly what we're fearing. We're giving energy to the fear. So the mind uses, the mind uses the, these thoughts. Reason is the tool for the mind to achieve its emotional needs. When it's used by the intellect, the emotion is usually unconscious. So what you need to understand is that our minds are a very rational mind. It always needs an excuse. It always needs an excuse. Okay, why did this happen? How could this happen to me? You understand? We, it's like we're programmed to always ask, why did it happen? Why did I let it happen to, etc.? We're always questioning with too much reason. Where how many times do I speak about the concept of bittal? You don't have to understand everything. Even the opposite. Our Torah tells us first emuna, then yedida. Our Torah tells us it's the opposite. First you have to go into emuna, then you, you'll understand it, which is completely the opposite model of the survival mechanism of the mind, which is to try to understand everything. And then have faith afterwards, where... What happens if I don't understand it? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna get stuck there. So the way your mind works is just to protect you. It's just a survival mechanism. And that, that could hurt you. Because then you're always gonna ask why, who did it, how could it happen to me, etc. And these questions, unfortunately, what do, the, what do these questions do? These are the kushot, kushot the question. These are the questions that unfortunately divide our heart. When we have a lot of questions in our life, that's the doubt that our heart, and what affects it? Our heart. Because then we start losing our beliefs. We start losing our beliefs because we have a lot of questions. What do you think is going to happen? Kushot, questions, doubt affects your heart. Affects your heart. Because then you're saying, you know what? If this happened and I prayed, maybe it's not worth praying. Maybe there's, maybe there's no God. Maybe it's all thing. So this is the, the constant war that we have every single year. We always speak about getting rid of a malik, getting rid of the doubt, getting rid of the doubt. Because if you start using your mind too much for reason, which is the tool of the mind, then it's always going to find out, I need to understand why this happened. I need to understand why. Why would I forgive them? It's not logical that I would forgive them. I'm going to become weak. It will be, it's going to throw you off. It's going to throw you off. But spirituality, you don't have to do that. Spirituality is something you do with your soul. Spirituality, you're able to use your consciousness. You're able to review the situation and you're able to see, did I take something personal? Why did I take it personal? Why am I taking everything personal so much? Or why am I constantly getting the same message in relationships that I'm always getting hurt all the time? Why am I always getting offended all the time? What is that teaching me? What does God want from me that I'm always getting hurt all the time? I'm always saying I'm being offended. I'm always seeing everybody's insulting me. What is God teaching me this? Because unfortunately, the same lessons keep on happening to us to give us that awareness so we can change it. And we're thinking, what, how much more are you going to hurt me, God? How much more are you going to punish me? How much more are you going to put me in this thing? And really, it's only teaching you, listen, I want you to change this. The fact that something repetitively happens to a person is to teach you that you have not fixed that situation. So it keeps on coming back and back and back and back and back and back and back. And, it, and it, would appear, it would almost appear that you're getting bullied in life. That's the common, common, common denominator that people feel. I feel like God's bullying me. He's constantly showing me, he's constantly sending people who don't love me. He's constantly missing opportunities because you don't, you're not afraid. You're afraid maybe you don't deserve a light. You're, you're, you, you don't, sometimes if a person is afraid he deserves light, he's going to constantly sabotage himself and, and find a way to do that. But it's normal. It's just to show you God's doing this to you. It's not to be upset. This is, a, this is the job of the ego, to be upset and to be resistant, to hold the anger. What you have to do is, okay, what can we do differently? 
what can we do differently? I always tell people, unless you start working on your self-esteem, don't go into a relationship. Because I guarantee you, you're going to be walk around, you're going to walk out of the relationship that you got insulted, something happened to you, etc. I guarantee it. Guarantee it's going to happen to you. Because when you're better and you're constantly better, you will say, that person was limited. There's nothing to do with me. You'll make it less about you. That is the key. And when you do that, you're absolutely, you're free. You're free. But if not, the same thing keeps on happening. The same thing keeps on happening. And it becomes like a, a bad rerun. And, and again, I keep on getting these negative thoughts. Keep, yes, because you're not focusing on the feeling behind it. You're not letting go of the feeling behind it. We're resisting the feeling behind it. It could be that we're resisting the feeling because we're focusing on, remember, on what or who did it. If I'm feeling anger, I could say, anger is teaching me I lost control. Let's say, anytime we have anger where it's teaching us, I lost control. Somebody, I lost control in my, in my life. Or I had an expectation, it wasn't, okay, that was my expectation. But if I start focusing, uh, Johnny did this to me, let me let go. Johnny did this to me, let me let go. And pasta, I'm thinking, well, Johnny, how can I let go? Letting go means it's a feeling and it passes through you. And just, you observe it, you let it pass through you, you don't try to stop it, and little by little, it just passes through you. Because negative energy just wants to pass through you. And this is exactly what he's saying here. He's saying here, letting go involves becoming aware of the feeling, letting it come up, stay with it, letting it run its course, without wanting to do anything different or changing. Letting the feeling be there, and to focus more on letting, focus more on letting the energy behind it. Very similar to, if, let's say I have a headache. What am I going to do if I have a headache? <sighs> I have a headache. Do you understand? Hold my head, tilting like this. I'm worrying about how am I going to go to how am I going to go to that meeting with a headache. All of a sudden, that headache became the focus of attention. I'm now giving energy to that headache. But if all of a sudden I stop thinking about it, what happens? All of a sudden, I take an Advil. What are, what happens? You feel better. I feel better. Who knows if the Advil worked? But my, I told my mind, calm down, stop worrying about it. You took an Advil, you let go. There's no more resistance. When I take an Advil, I'm not thinking about the headache anymore. I completely released any kind of pressure towards the headache anymore. I'm not even thinking about the headache anymore. It's over. The resistance is what keeps things alive. The resistance. And remember, in order to do this exercise, you have to do this completely silent. You have to breathe and you have to observe. It's just a feeling. It's just a feeling. It's not reality. It's just a feeling that passes through you. And when you can do this mechanism... You're going to get out of arguments in two minutes. You're going to get, change your state very, very quickly. You won't fall with these emotional breakdowns that just become overbearing. Yes, our sages tell us there's days that have different energy. There's days that we wake up and we know the energy is completely different. But imagine the energy already being that way and, you, and that person with a negative, con, with a negative, uh, uh, a negative mo emotional state. It doesn't take much doesn't take much for that day to be gone. And this is what Reb Nachman says. So one of the ways that I, you could do this, you could do this observing it. Another way you could do it, like we said the other day in his Bodhidut, talk about it with your creator. That also works. There's another way talking about the feeling, expressing the feeling to your creator. Hashem, Reb Nassan, would have anxiety. Hashem, I have anxiety. Give me bitachon, give me trust. Let me go of any fallen fears. Today we had a phenomenal class on Ein Old Bivado, this meditation of Ein Old Bivado, which is, which is the gematria of the first letters, 1111. Recognizing that there's nothing but God. So if something happens to me, if somebody insults me, I could say there's nothing but God. 1111. It's all one. It's only from Hashem. I let go of any resistance. If I say something is from Hashem, there's no resistance anymore. It's gone. The resistance is gone. The acceptance is there. Resistance is gone. I'm already at a higher consciousness. Once I accept things, that situation itself becomes part of my higher consciousness. You understand? I bring it into my consciousness. That becomes a grow, something that I grow with. All my challenges that we've had, 
you've handled it well, you've accepted them, they became part of you now. They became part of your, your, your Rav Nachman refers it to a Rishimut, the imprints that you, you're able to receive anytime you go through a situation and you handled it well, you get a sort of a, a, a positive imprint and you almost get a new mind. You get an expansion of a mind. You get into Mochem Gadlut. He refers it to a mature mentality, which is exactly what happened when we were in Egypt. In Egypt, you are in the 49th level. We were a complete emotional wreck. And we walked into Shavuot with the highest level of Das, with the highest level of consciousness. You went from completely a mess to the highest level of vitality. That was the purpose of Shavuot. The whole purpose of Shavuot was to go from that that, that real emotional breakdown where we couldn't even speak, we, couldn't, we didn't have the words to speak because we were completely emotional and broken, to, 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 to those 49 days of building that consciousness where you got the greatest level of dot came to a person on Shavuot because of his work on those 49 days. The same thing with any situation in our lives is to get us that. Another way, like I said many times, of why you have to let things go, it's very simple. According to the Tomer Devorah, very simple. Our sages say, there was, there was a famous Gemara, there are two major sages were, were praying, and one was Rabbi Akiva, and one was Rabbi Ishmael, I believe. Can't remember the exact Gemara. And basically, there was a call in heaven that they said Rabbi Akiva's prayer is answered. So, they, so the Gemara's questioning, why was Rabbi Akiva a greater person than Rabbi Ishmael? He wasn't. They were both equal in knowledge, but there was a call in heaven that said the reason why Rabbi Akiva's prayer was answered because Rabbi Akiva was very, very, he let things go. He let things go. Basically, he created a spiritual flow below that he let things go below. So in heaven, he had a little bit of an extra favor. So when you also, when you need help from your creator and you're asking him, hey, let, let things go that I made. I made a few messes. Can you let them go? He's going to check your books, and you're going to say, yes, this guy is a very easygoing person. He lets things go. Mida kenege mida. Measure for measure. But when you're sitting there praying for mercy, God, I need mercy, mercy. Oh, can you forgive me? No. Please, mercy, mercy. It's a different channel. You're not letting go below. You're, you're, you're living in anger, and you want your creator to be, you're living in negative 150, and, you're crea- and you want your, lo- your creator to be at 350. How is that going to work? That's where we always want to vibrate. Thoughts of vibrations. You always want to, God, God is your shadow. David Melch says, God is my shadow. I always want to vibrate at what I want in heaven. How do you want heaven to treat you? How in the world do you want heaven to, to you want mercy in heaven? Who doesn't need mercy in heaven? Is there one person here that doesn't want mercy? So when a person is living in mercy, what happens? He starts living in that consciousness of mercy. And he gets to a very, very high level of mercy. And for him, when you're living in mercy, very easily to forgive people. Because that is your consciousness. You're not holding hate. It's very easy. So guess what? Don't you think your relationships are going to be better if you're very easygoing? Yes. (laughs) Because you're not going to hold in resentment. You're going to always find a positive angle. Don't you think you're going to be more successful in business? Absolutely. Because you're going to not think you're a victim to to your competitor, you're going to see that, you know what, maybe there's a blessing in the skies, a door has to close in order to open, you're going to look at challenges as growth opportunities, so across the board, you're going to see, there's mercy, I just have to attract it, so this, this spills over across the board, it spills over across the board in your life, so the advantages of letting go, you just become a different person, and then heaven just matches exactly where you are. And when you're, and you live like that, you, you're, you're in a different planet. You're, in a different, you're, you're living in a different life. Because, and then there's no worry about all these thoughts that come to my head. Uh, uh, I'm waking up, I want to kill this person. No, no such thing. It, that thought doesn't come past, past a person living in that, in that state. You, you would never even say that. You would never even, if you're married. You know, Rabbi Rush, we spoke about this week. When you change the way you look at somebody internally, they change externally. We spoke about that class also this week. And that's because what happens is when you're in a higher consciousness, you're sending them love. And when you send them love, you get a reciprocal effect by that person. 
So imagine if we had a couple and we spent more time praying for our couples instead of resenting them. You don't think our relationships would be completely different? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because the Yetzirah just wants you to hold an ego. It's, the Yetzirah and the ego are one. Anything below here, if you look here, anything below 200 is all ego. Is all ego. Anything below 200 is all ego. Pride is ego. Anger is ego. Desire is ego. Fear is ego. Control. Grief. Not letting things go. Ego. Sometimes we use these, we stay in a very low level, very low motion just because we don't want to face life. We'd rather be comfortable. That is also very ego driven. All of these is the ego. As you get to 200, now you're in your soul state. As you get to 200 above, that is the beginning that you're in your soul state. This is the beginning where things happen. And that's where you see the energy changing. The energy changes. Ultimately, they say, according to his work, that healing happens at joy at 540, which is very, what Ram Nachman tells us, that the main cause of illness is unhappiness. And the greatest healer is joy. Because what happens? When you get to a level of joy, what do you think is happening? Endorphins are going off. Your immune system is completely different. Your, your telemeters, everything's changing. So this is exactly the science behind why Reb Nachman says, what do you mean joy is the greatest healer? He says that a thousand times. What, how, what makes joy heal me? What is, because I, according to him, when you're at joy, you're at 550 degrees, you're at 540 consciousness. You're in such a higher level of consciousness that your body heals. This is very, very, Joe Dispenza speaks about this all the time. That he get, he, you know, Joe Dispenza, a lot of the healers are basically getting people to meditate to a much, a much higher level of consciousness. He works it differently. He's telling you more to let go little by little. Let go, let go. But ultimately, when you get to this level, you can turn on that switch in a meditation and you're in a healing mode. You know how to get to that healing mode. You almost feel it coming to you. It's a beautiful thing to be able to, to get to that, to that mindset. But again, if I'm, the, the, the problem is the, the ex, no acceptance, no forgiveness, and a lack of surrendering. That is the source of the problem. And that is all, like we said before, very ego-based. It's not soul-based. Because the essence of knowledge... Our sages teach us that when the, the greatest level of knowledge that you will receive is to recognize you know nothing. Okay? The highest level of knowledge, our sages say, the, the taklas of the idea, the highest level of knowledge is to recognize you don't know anything. So can you imagine, when you get up there already, you're going to recognize, oh my God, I don't know anything. You're not going to know anything. So imagine when a person is in a very low conscious, what does he say? I know everything. <laughs> and that's what stops them from growth. So for me, Baruch Hashem, being in Reb Nachman's teachings for 20 years, when something happens beyond my comprehension, I go straight into surrender mode. Straight into surrender mode. Because I know it's the resistance that's going to keep me there. And I know the solution to any exit, the exit strategy, our sages say across the board, is joy. Our exit strategy is joy. Every exit strategy, to every solution for joy you will go out is joy. And the only way to, go to get to joy is to think greater than I feel, is to get to myself to a place where I don't have to use reason. Because if I use reason, back to who did it, how he did it, I'm not getting respected, I'm getting abused, I'm getting this. <laughs> You're not going into surrender mode. Surrender means who, what, I don't know anything. I'm going into surrender. I'm running to surrender. I'm running to surrender. Surrender is where everything happens. Surrender and joy is a place you go to. It doesn't mean you have to have it. You need to go there. When I tell you go someplace, you're going to tell me, where, where am I going? Nobody's asking you to ask directions. Hashem's telling you, throw away your knowledge and just go there. And I will tell you the difference. And I will show you your difference. It's, 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 Rabbi Nachman's teachings, is, 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 the whole teachings is be careful. Be careful your enemy could be your intelligence. 
that the highest form of service could be the simplest, the simplest person speaking from the heart. He clearly, his whole teachings are nothing more but complete, complete simplicity, surrender, finding the good points in people, keeping it super simple. No sophistication at all. And that is the greatest sophistication, he's saying. The greatest sophistication is to recognize you don't need sophistication. And when you live like that, you, you live in a different world. You live in a different world. You, you, opportunities come to you because you have a tremendous vessel. But when we don't live like that, unfortunately, we're, we're limited. We're limited to the consciousness that we are. We're limited to where we are. An anger person is limited to... He's going to always be angered. Somebody's going to piss him off. The cable company, the... It doesn't... Who cares what it is? Who cares what it is? When you're higher conscious, you don't talk about the cable company for three days, calling it the cable company, five, day, five hours talking about the cable company. This is how you want to live your life. It becomes your life. The cable, a remote control will ruin your day. And then you're asking, I don't understand how Hashem doesn't bless me with money. He doesn't bless me with this. I don't have a zivog. I don't have this. Because you don't have a vessel. You don't have a vessel. Giving you a vessel, giving more money to an angry person is not going to solve the problem. Giving more light to an angry person. Once the anger, angry person starts surrendering and stops giving control, because remember, anger is rooted in control. Fear leads you to control. Too much control leads you to anger, because things don't go your way. So control is really the best way to knock your creator out. So what I do is I let the feeling happen, any feeling that I have. If I notice the feeling, I don't judge it, I let it pass through. And little by little, just like the headache, I let it go. Oh, the headache's gone. I stop thinking about the headache. It's gone. It's gone. Any kind of pain, stop thinking about it. The resistance to the pain is what keeps going. Let it go. Let it go. The more you resist, the more you let go, the more you let God. And then healing comes to us. We're much happier in relationships. But this is, you know, any time, um, you know, according to Rabbi Rush, this is why one of the greatest ways, not only to let it go, but he wants us to even thank Hashem for the experience. That is ultimate acceptance. When you say thank you for that experience, you are completely taking the batteries out of your ego. You're taking your ego and you're killing it. You, 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 there's no more batteries left. Because gratitude breaks everything. Our sages take tears opens up the gates. Gratitude, you have no gates. And sometimes it's not easy to get there, like we said. This is why you have to run there. Don't let the rational mind, don't let your rational mind allow you. You're going to see this practice as you're going to start letting go. And you're going to start, the people are going to pop and how. You're going to have to understand it's not going to be easy at first. It's going to be very awkward because it's a new experience. Remember, resistance or, or you could try to let things go and it keeps on happening, that it just tells you there's more resisting to do. <laughs> it's, there's more surrendering to do. Anytime that you're doing something and it's not working, it's because there's probably a Category 5 uh, resentment in that person. And so, or Category 7. So the more resentment, the more you build up, the more you have to release. 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 And then, like I said, your life changes. You, you vibrate on love, you vibrate on, on, on willingness, inspiring, merciful harmony. Who do you think comes, who do you think you meet? You meet, you meet your soulmate, you meet different people, and you have better relationships. Any questions on this? Any questions on this? Yes. Yes. How do you practically do it every day? You have to, that's why you, correct. Just like any, I could tell you your physical shape is based on how, how long you work out. You have to do this every day. Anytime you're holding negative energy, you'll feel the energy. Because remember, I, I observe it, I let it, and I let it pass its course. Let it pass its course. I don't resist it. I don't focus on what made me angry, who made me angry. And I say, let it go. Let it go. It's just a feeling. It's not reality. And little by little, you'll see the sensation completely gone. Again, it's the holding and thinking and obsessing with it that keeps it alive. We know Jews, they love to control everything, love to hold on to, they love to worry. 
Worry is a form of control, by the way. People think, I have to worry. If not, I'm not taking responsibility. That's what people think. If I don't worry, I'm not taking responsibility. I'm being careless. How can I just trust like that? What's going to happen to my mortgage? What's going to happen? This is unfortunately, people think they worry. It's just like saying, if I don't question that guy and every single girl he's gone out with, if I don't question every single phone call, then I'm not doing my job. I'm going to get cheated on. No! That's what's chasing him away. Because he's, he's, he's getting uh, FBI questions every single time. That's what's chasing him away because he sees you're not trusting me. That's what's killing him. It's the non-worrying that's making, making a problem out of nothing that's driving him crazy. You understand? That's the problem. It's not the... But when you trust, people, tr people want to be around people that trust. The worrying is sabotaging your blessing. So you want to sabotage your blessing? Worry. Because you're controlling the outcome. You're controlling something too much. And when you tr either you trust or move on from a different relationship. But going into a relationship with, without trusting, without building a neutral trust and having that trust, then get out of it. Because it's, it's, you're wasting your time. It's a waste of time. But make sure you're not bringing baggage from other relationships or other situations that, that you're now reflecting and, and projecting on that, on that person that he didn't do a thing. He didn't do a thing. I have, to, I have, I have a friend of mine that, you know, the, the, the mother was, unfortunately, um, she was abused by a rabbi a long, long time ago. So obviously anything to do with a beard, forget it. Shrita, I don't want to see rabbis, I want to do this. So all of a sudden her kids, I don't, want to, I, don't, my, I don't want my kids in Jewish school, I don't want my grandkids. So she's taking all of this situation from 20 years ago and now she's bringing it to, 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 to why are the kids affected now by something that happened to you 23 years ago, by some scumbag that was not mentally well? What is, why are your kids now punished for that today by something that happened to you? This is what happens. We bring in old, old stuff and then we punish new people by, by having an energy. If you want, this is a phenomenal book. It talks about more of the mechanism of letting go, but it's pretty much the same thing. Telling you, let the feeling, remember, using people, if somebody smokes, or you drink, I don't want to feel. That's not feeling. <laughs> when I'm using drugs, I'm not feeling. That's ultimate resistance. What do you think? People don't come into recovery with tremendous amount of uh, uh, emotional baggage from stuff that they've been holding on to, letting it pass, it's just a feeling, and, and, and letting it take this course. And then another feeling might come up. Remember, it's not like you're going to go from shame to, to love. <laughs> what happens when you get from shame? What do you think is going to come up? The higher feeling comes usually. When shame is gone, what do you think comes? Guilt. Depending on where you are, usually the higher feeling always comes up. It doesn't just go from here to love. Then another feeling comes up. And then you have to work on surrendering that feeling. I do this with a breathing. I do the Wim Hof breathing. And then I start observing my feelings. And I start letting it go. Let it go. Let it go. And I feel I, after a good indication that you did a good meditation, a good indication that you had a good prayer, is if you feel completely lighter. Lightness, feeling lighter, Feeling more clarity is an indication that you've let things go. Feeling heavy after a prayer, it's a sign you need to go back. Go back. You have not done the work. That's the, our, our sages are teaching. How do you feel afterwards? Because prayer and, and, giving and letting go is supposed to renew your energy, from Nachman says. So if my energy is not renewed after a spiritual meditation, if you don't feel more calmer and more conscious, that means something that you're doing, and you're not hitting the right button. So go back and get to the right button. That's the indication. Reb Nachman says, even of a broken heart, after a broken heart, the reward is, is joy. That means you handle the pain well. You handle the pain well. But you'll see, as you grow, you'll be more compassionate towards people. You'll be completely different towards people. You'll see things differently. You'll judge them favorably. You'll be less self-centered. You'll be less needy. You'll have more wisdom. You'll have better days. It's a whole life. It's not a one, two, three. It's a whole life. 
Your diet will change. You won't, you're not going to be in pain all the time and need to sh- stuff your face every time you don't want to think. Everything changes. But when that's not changed, you're going to have anything in the sun to stop thinking that. And that's the resistance which con- continues to form the personality of the person, etc. So may Hashem help us all that we should all let go. Let go, let go, let go of the ex-husbands, the ex-wives, the traumas, the, everything. Let it go. When, when you let go a little, you'll be a little happy. When you let go a lot, you'll be very happy. And I'm telling you as a Scorpio how much I worked on this <laughs> for 10 years of my life, how much letting go I've got. I've let so much go. I can open up borders and walls. I've let so much go, and I've seen the tremendous rewards because I used to hold on to everything. So may Hashem help us that we should all let go and, 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 and draw tremendous mercy from Hashem. Have a great day.